Okay, so you join me at one of my favorite spots. This time quite a bit further from home. I haven't been to this spot for a long time because, well, we've had the longest lockdown in the world apparently here in Melbourne. So, I've come back out to this wheat field, which I've come out to quite a bit in the past. But last time I was here, there were no crops. <laughs> now there's crops. Uh, looks quite lovely. And way off in the distance there are the, uh, the pair of hills that I photographed many, many times. Uh, in fact, the photo that appears in the top of the homepage of my website is of these, uh, these hills. And I love them because they're very simple. It's a very pure composition. And probably also because it was a very lucky composition. I'd actually been photographing about 200 meters up this, um, this uh, field here and didn't get any interesting light. So I packed up and I started driving home. And as I got about half a kilometer down the road, all of a sudden there was a little break in the clouds. The sun came through and it just hit those two hills. And it was beautiful because all the foreground was in shadow and just those hills were lit. And it was such a simple, clean composition that it remains one of my favorites. And it kind of sort of sparked my interest again in very simple compositions. So I'll come back here again today. The sun is now behind me because it's, it's 4.30 in the afternoon, 4.35. So the sun's still reasonably high. It's about 35, 40 degrees off the horizon, but it's already kissing these hills in beautiful ways with lots of shadow and, and highlight detail. Um, oh, that plane's banking hard. So I wanted to see what else I could get here. And, um, and now that we have a field here with, uh, with crops in it, see if I can get some interesting shots with them in the foreground as well. Let's see how we go. Now you'll notice that I've got the RF 100 to 400 on the camera again. I really want to use it as much as I can at the moment just to see how it performs in different locations. Now just one suggestion I want to, want to offer, you'll hear a lot of people say that you need to learn to photograph in manual, and that's true. But there are some very simple practical reasons for that. In this kind of situation, for example, I've got reasonably um, dark foreground and a fairly light background. And as I move my camera up and down to alter my composition, if I leave any of the exposure triangle elements, the aperture, the shutter speed, or the ISO on auto, it continuously adjusts and po quite possibly not the way I want it to. For example, as I pan down, it's gonna give me more exposure to correctly expose the foreground, but then it's gonna blow out the background and make that too light. Likewise, if I pan up, if, if I lift the camera up, well then it's gonna try and expose for the lighter area and make the foreground too dark. So by setting your exposure manually, allow your camera first to, to set, say, one of the things automatically, maybe the ISO, if you've determined that you want a certain shutter speed and a certain aperture because you want to control depth of field or movement of this wheat, for example, you want to either blur it or you want to freeze it, and then let your camera decide the ISO. But then once you see what that ISO is, just manually set it and then adjust it to what you want so it's a reasonable compromise between your light and your shaded areas. That's assuming you don't want to um, exposure bracket because you've got a really high contrast scene. Um, in a typical scene, you won't need to exposure bracket, but you really should be deciding yourself where that compromise lies between not overexposing the bright areas and not underexposing the dark areas. Now I've taken my self timer off here because I'm shooting at 200th of a second. I'm on a tripod, so I'm not worried about camera shake. But at 200th of a second, I'm probably gonna get a still a little bit of movement in the wheat in the foreground. Um, ideally, I'd like lots of movement, so it's really obvious, or I'd like it frozen. Um, because I'm blurring it out, I probably would like it uh, moving. So it's not just blurred out in terms of depth of field, but it's blurred out in terms of movement as well. So one reason I love shooting hills is you, you get all this movement of light across them. You get shadows and highlights and stuff, and it's really interesting. Now we've got light on everything. Once light is on everything, it just looks boring and bland. Now I have to get filter adapter for this lens. All right. Okay, on you go. Okay, so on this lens now, I've got a uh, 67 to 77 mil Freewell adapter ring and attached to that magnetically is my 10 stop ND. So now, I can have a very long exposure. We're talking a few seconds actually. Oh, I like that light, I like that light, gotta get it. Now I need the self timer back on again, quick. 
All right. Oh, that's nice. Trouble is now, of course, the light's going to be moving across my hill and painting it, but that could be interesting. Now the light's in the foreground. I'm going to do that again. All right, so we're looking at one and a third seconds f6.3, 100 ISO. Oh, yeah, see, so these could be interesting. It's usually in situations like this, um, you know, I put up a video recently about s some of the things that I've, some of the top tips, you know, I've learned as a photographer over the years. And one of them was to shoot when you're uncomfortable, shoot before you're ready, shoot after you think it's over. This is kind of an example of shooting before I'm ready because, oh, see, another example. The light is just amazing. Uh, a bit longer exposure. When things are really changeable like this and you don't know quite how it's going to work out, that's often when you, you end up with something really unique. You go, oh wow, look at that, I didn't notice that when I was shooting it. Right now I've got moving light, changing light. It's kissing the hills, it's moving across the hills. I've got movement here in the foreground. Because I put the 10 stop ND, I've got nice long exposure, so that's all going to be wavy and blurry. Plus, because I'm shooting wide open on this lens, f6.3 at this focal length, which is about 140 mil. I've got fairly shallow depth of field. So the background is, uh, sorry, the foreground is blurry because of the shallow depth of the field, but it's also blurry because there's movement because of the long exposure. And that's thanks to the 10 stop ND filter I put on it. <clears throat> I have no idea how they're gonna look until I look at them. And yeah, see, oh yeah, see there's some interesting shots here. It's so changeable from one minute to the next. I love it. Now in this situation, I think because I've got a large mass of subject matter in the foreground that making that sharp and making the background blurry is probably a waste of time. If I'm going to do that, then the background's kind of irrelevant. I may as well just get rid of it altogether and just focus on the foreground completely. But if I've got an interesting background, which is this nice stripy hill, then having a blurry foreground kind of directs the eye to the subject, to that stripy hill in the background. And so it makes sense then to shift my focus to whatever is in the background in this case. I'm going to get some close-up shots of this wheat because I think it looks so cool. But as a landscape shot, that's not what I'm after this time. I'm after the hill. And this forms like a, a canvas leading up to it. Stop moving. I'm going to turn the image stabilization off. Get me back in position. Zoom out a little. Focus, long, oh, nice blurry foreground. Oh yeah, that's unusual. That's really unusual. Oh, this light is so interesting. Now, just one thing you notice that I turned off my image stabilization there, and that was because as I moved my camera down into the position that I wanted, the image stabilization continued to move a bit to soften that movement. So it change my composition again. <laughs> it moved the hill too far up in the frame. So by turning that off, wherever I put the camera, that's where it stays. It doesn't have a, you know, drift. It doesn't drift afterwards. I love simple compositions. Maybe because I'm a simple person. Maybe that's what it is. All right, I'm going to wait for that light to move again. And there it goes. Magic. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool, so different. Oh, this one's gonna be unique. Ah, oh, the cloud's coming again. How's that one look? Uh, it's definitely, definitely unique. Oh, I love that. Another one, come on, before the cloud go, ah. Oh. Ah, I missed it, the cloud went over it. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting trying to get this. The trouble is I can't use a two second timer on this because the light is moving so fast. I need to grab it instantly the moment I see it. So I'm shooting f800 ISO 400th of a second. Changing light conditions like this is so cool. They can be a bit nerve wracking because you're stressing about getting the shot, but you know, you've, you just got to make a decision. You might not have everything in the shot you want. Like I wanted long exposure to get the blurry foreground, but then because of the long exposure, I need a two second timer. And because of the two second timer and the long exposure, by the time the light is right and I hit the button, three and a half, four seconds pass, and then the light's changed again. So I've got to do it this way. This is the kind of photography that can be really exciting because you know you're kind of pushing the limits of how much information you can juggle in your head at once and the compromises that you need to make in terms of capturing what's happening, 
you know, setting the exposure the way you want in terms of depth of field, movement blur, or movement freezing, um, you know, correct exposure, all that sort of stuff. So it, it can be quite challenging, but when you get it right, it's so cool and it's so satisfying because you've literally captured a moment frozen in time forever that will never happen again. And that's really cool. <sighs> what are you doing, light? Uh, I think you're gonna be stuck behind clouds for a while now. All right, I think I've got some great shots there. I won't know for certain until I get him into Lightroom and have a good look, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. Uh, I think I might get some close-up shots of this wheat now and uh, see how I go with that. What I'm looking at doing here is getting a shot of the wheat with nothing, nothing else in the background except more wheat, but a shallow depth of field with the wheat in the immediate foreground Luckily I'm on the edge of the field here, so I've actually got the face of the, of the wheat stalks in front of me. So get those uh, nice and sharp, shallow depth of field, F8, 320th of a second. What ISO am I on? About 640, 500 ISO, 500 ISO. Wait for the wind to stop moving a little bit. Actually, I think I'll go up to 500th of a second. ISO 640, there we go. Yeah, I like that. So it's just the wheat in the foreground and all the wheat behind it blurred out. Now I'm actually gonna try something else. I'm actually going to go back to ISO 100. I'm gonna go for long exposure. So what I want here is, where did I put it? I wanna put the I want to put the ND back on it and just try a sort of a milky, painterly, long exposure of this moving wheat and just see what it looks like, just as an experiment. Okay, so 13 seconds, F8. Oops, I didn't do the, didn't do the self-timer, so I probably got a nice bump on that one. Uh, I like the fact that it's still shallow depth of field, F8, background's blurred. But because it's a long exposure with this ND filter on it, that we got movement. Now I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to put the self timer on so I don't bump it. All right, focus on the foreground. Two second timer, 13 second exposure at F800 ISO. Let's see what that does. And this is a good time to try this because the sun is behind clouds now, so at least the light is consistent over the, you know, the length of that exposure. That's really blurry. <laughs> I don't think I want it that blurry. So I'm going to bump up my ISO to 1600. I want a shorter exposure. I'd like about a second if I can. Let's try a second. So that means my ISO is going to be about 1250. Focus on the foreground. Yeah, that's nice. All right, let's see what that does. So this is one second after two second timer. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That almost looks like a painting, he said, hopefully. When you've got overcast light, like we have right now, just look for shapes and patterns and lines. Um, since you're not going to have much in the way of light and shade, just look for different textures, lines, shapes, and just get in tight on different things. And use shallow depth of field to separate one object from another object. You can turn a very ordinary looking area into something quite interesting. 100 ISO, actually I'm gonna take this back off. So easy when they're magnetic. Not bothering to check the level of my camera or anything like that, I'm just winging it. I can always fix that in post. People worry so much about having their horizon dead level, but in software you can just fix that. Just just rotate it, it's no big deal. All right, I think I'm just about done here. An easy trap to fall into is to think that when you get to a location, you need to try and take lots of different photos. Uh, I think that puts way too much pressure on us and I think you're far better off when you get to a location, aim to get one photo. Um, and even better, just aim to get comfortable and familiar with your location. You know, if you can't come back again for a long time, then of course you want to try and get a few shots. But 
I think you're far better off to take a number of shots with a view to getting one great shot, one really good shot that you're happy with, uh, rather than trying to bag half a dozen really good ones. Because then it's like most things, you know, it just dilutes, it just dilutes the outcome. But if you have a single-minded um, approach to just getting one image that you're very happy with, and that all the images that you take lead to that point where you go, this is the shot, then it's less stressful. You know, think of it like a calendar. Um, quite a few photographers uh, I know put out a calendar each year. I don't yet, maybe I will one day. But, um, you know, we're talking 12 shots, 14 at, at best, you know, one for the cover and one for the back cover as well. Um, you know, and that's out of a whole year of shooting. So you don't need to get half a dozen great shots from one outing. One great shot is enough. And oftentimes you will get no great shots, but it doesn't matter. You're out in nature and enjoying yourself. Don't make your happiness contingent upon reaching a certain outcome, because then you'll always be miserable. Because nine times out of 10, you don't get the outcome you want. So you're gonna be miserable most of the time. What's the point of that? Instead, make your happiness contingent upon the simple fact that you went out, that you breathed in the fresh air and enjoyed just being out in nature. Then you'll always win. You're always successful. Yeah, a long time ago, I said that one of the best definitions of success is progress. You know, if you define success as simply moving forward, then you're successful every day. You're always successful. If you, if you decide that success is reaching a predetermined outcome, a destination, well then, supposedly, you'll finally be successful when you get to it, but no sooner do you get to it, and now it's, the, now it's history, it's the past, and now you need a new <laughs> objective to strive towards to be happy again. So stuff that. Just make doing the practice of being out, maybe taking photos, that's progress. Progress is success. And then you're successful every day. I'm a huge success because I go out and take photos almost every day. So whether they're crap or they're good is irrelevant. All right. Well, I think that's it for me for today. If I get one good shot out of this, then that's great. If I didn't, well, I'm out here and it's nice. So uh, thanks for hanging out with me. Hopefully you got something out of this. And uh, if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, make sure you give it a thumbs down. And hopefully I'll see you again next week. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.